Very good morning to everyone, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are here this morning to uh, celebrate the Holy Communion. So welcome again once and for everyone to the Wesley Penang's online service. We thank the Lord for another Sunday that we can gather in His presence and gather together as a community of faith. Now let us spend some time in quiet before the Lord, before we start the service. Father, we thank you Lord for your presence this morning, that you are here with us. We thank you Lord for the Holy Spirit that pours upon us and in upon our church, upon our community of faith. Lord, we come before you remembering your amazing love, your amazing grace, your faithfulness to us through this week. So, Father God, we thank you, oh Father God. Lord, today, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to worship you, to serve you, Sanctify us, O oh Father God, again by your grace and your mercy that is new every day. And Lord Jesus, we pray that the preparation of our hearts, the singing, the worship, the reading of your word, O oh Father God, may fall on fertile soil. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in your respective homes, please stand for the call to worship. Be still and know that the Lord is God. He will be exalted among the nations. The Lord of hosts is with us. He is our fortress from now until forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the opening prayer. Merciful God, we thank you for giving us a new day where we can come to you to worship you. At this sacred time of worshipping you and listening to your word, may you silence all the voices that are not from you and remove the hindrances that hinder us from focusing on you so that our being will be fully saturated by your presence and your word. Amen. Indeed, our Lord Jesus is worthy of all praise and awesome. Let us continue to worship the Lord by the opening song led by our brother, Jared Tan. Father, you are 
Let us pray the prayer of illumination together wholeheartedly. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Reading from the book, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the man with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. 
After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We continue the service with a song of preparation. Have thine own way, Lord. Let us sing it meaningfully and worship fully to the Lord.
Dear friends, indeed, it's very good to be here and uh, come to you <clears throat> to share this message about putting our talents to work and uh, a message about discipleship. Before I begin, shall we bow our heads in prayer and commit this time to the Lord? Father, in your great mercy, you have granted to us, Lord, the wealth from your kingdom. And so as we incline our hearts and our minds to your word, teach us, Lord, transform us, rebuke us, Lord, if we have gone wrong, and guide us, Lord, into the paths of everlasting light. Use me, O oh Lord, as your vessel, and may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts, O oh Lord, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This passage that I'm covering today is uh, something which we have been taking from uh, the Bible reading plan that we have been doing for the year. And uh, in particular, uh, we're looking at Matthew chapter 24 and 25 uh, in this period. Now, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 deals with a number of uh, parables uh, about the end of the age. And... Uh, it's worth actually understanding what a parable is all about. Now, a very large part of, the, of uh, Jesus' teaching has to do with parables, and he tended to teach using parables. What is a parable? Uh, Professor Klein Snodgrass, a, a Bible scholar, uh, actually touched upon a parable by defining it as imaginary gardens with real toadstools. Imaginary gardens with real toadstools. Now, I, I interpret that in uh, layman's terms as um, imaginary stories with real problems. And it's important when we are trying to understand a parable that uh, as Jesus used a parable often to respond to a question, therefore it's important for us to actually know what is the question that's being asked, who is asking that question, and how do we discern the answer to Jesus's, uh, the answer to the question or Jesus' answer to the question that's being posed. So let me highlight that again. We need to know who's asking the question so then we know when Jesus replies who is intended, who is the intended audience uh, for this parable to discern. Secondly, what exactly is the question? And thirdly, what is the answer? And parables are interesting because the answer quite often is the punchline right at the end. Uh, and you will find this quite consistently in the in the parables that we read that Jesus at the end gives a why saying towards the end. So we're going we're gonna to track that. So what then is the question and who is asking the question? Now, if you go back all the way to, to chapter 24, and I hope you have your Bibles with you. I've got mine open here. Chapter 24, verse 1, actually says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples uh, came up to him to call his attentions to the building. And then Jesus replies to them and says, Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And uh, to this, they were shocked. And at a later point, the disciples in verse 3 come to Jesus and says, uh, When is this? And coming. In fact, let me make sure that I get it right. Uh, I read it to you. Verse 3 of chapter 24. Again, refer to your Bible. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And you have that in, in that projection that's being. So that is the question. Uh, which the parables that follow subsequently will answer. And Jesus issues a series of parables about the faithful and uh, the, the faithful and the unfaithful 
servant. And then we have the parable at chapter 25, verse 1, about the 10 virgins, uh, the, the ones who were prepared and the ones who were not prepared. And then finally, we come to today's reading about uh, the parable of the talents. And so the parable of the talents is responding to a question about the end of the age. When is Jesus coming? But more importantly, what Jesus is telling them about what to do until he comes. And so I'd like to uh, keep that focus for us, that we know that this message is intended for the disciples and therefore by extension us too in this time who call ourselves as followers of Jesus. And this question or this parable answers, what do we do in the interim period until Christ comes again? As well as answer the question, what about those who are asking, when is the end coming? We see all these COVID-19 disasters, wars, famines, pestilence, corruption, all these big issues. When is the end coming? And what do we do while we're waiting? Now, Jesus' parable uh, can be best understood if I place this question at the back of your mind, uh, which is, if you were entrusted 20 years worth of your wages to multiply. You know, if your boss came to you or if you're, uh, um, the one whom you are reporting to came to you and said, here you go, 20 years of your wages into your hand, go and get working and multiply this. What would you do? It's worth thinking about. Uh, I know a number of people are actually uh, being faced with the difficult prospect of having uh, VSSs, or even if not VSSs, are working on projects where uh, they are put in charge of uh, large sums of resources and, and, uh, and money, really, to complete the work, uh, so much so that the quantum of money is many times the salary that they would have. And what would you do? And so Jesus presents this parable, this imaginary story of three servants or slaves, doulos is, is the name that's given to them, uh, and, and their responses to him. So let's look at the text behind this question. And uh, I want to go back to the text that our dear sister Florence read very beautifully for us just now. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Now, that uh, beginning there, again, it will be like a man. Uh, it's actually the, a link to the previous parable, which ended in, uh, in verse 13, about waiting wisely for the bride to come. But here, uh, Jesus is expanding the scope it's not just about waiting for the bride to come or, or the main man to arrive on the scene or, or in this case, uh, the end of the age when Jesus comes again. It's not just about waiting and he expands it. So again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. And so it's important to know that when Jesus is teaching this parable, he's teaching about what the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God will be like. Where Jesus is king, and uh, he's going away and he's coming back again. Be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Now, this was actually quite common. So when Jesus tells his parable, a lot of people would actually understand this. In the, uh, in the Middle Eastern uh, world, wealthy landowners or wealthy estate owners would sometimes leave the estate in the care of the servants or in the care of their slaves and say, I'm going away. And the trip could be anywhere from uh, a week, three months, years, or even decades. They don't know how long. The business trips were long. We didn't have all these planes and Air Asia flying everywhere. It would take a long journey by foot or by donkey or by horse. And uh, you don't know when the master may come, especially if they're attacked en route by robbers. So the wealth of the entire estate is a portion out and responsibilities given to the servants and the slaves in order to continue the work and to expand what they've been given. Verse 15 goes on to say, To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one, uh, another one bag, 
each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now, uh, if you are reading the NIV 2011 version, that's what is written in the NIV version. But if you are reading maybe uh, ESV or NRSV or some other version, you might find other words being described. Uh, one of them would be five talents, three, ta uh, two talents, or one talent. Why is that so? Now, we've just had the first two verses, and I want to start making my first observation for us to think about. And that is that the master entrusts his wealth to his servants now while he goes away. I say that again, the master entrusts his wealth to his servants now while he goes away. So the kingdom of heaven is like the master who has gone away for a period of time. But while he has gone away, he's entrusting his wealth, the riches of his kingdom, to his servants. The term that is given in Greek is called uh, talanta. Uh, in Greek, talanta or talanton uh, in the New Testament period meant a weight of money or a conversion of value. Now, you might be wondering, what is the weight of the money that we're talking about and what type of uh, currency is being used? Is it gold? Is it silver? Is it uh, drachmas, uh, minas, or is it denarii, the denominations of that time? Uh, so let me answer a few uh, one by one. The talanta or the talanton is a weight of approximately 58.9 kilograms. Uh, that was the ancient measure uh, used during the time of the New Testament. Uh, it may change over different periods of time, but it's quite heavy. So you can imagine a bag uh, containing 50 plus kilos of currency in it. The thing is that the text in the Greek doesn't really say whether it was gold, silver, or something else. The NIV version goes and puts it as gold. Uh, but quite common in that period of time, uh, one talent would actually be translated to about 6,000 denarii. Now, a denarii or denarii is the equivalent of one day's wage for a laborer. So if I were to give one denarii, and we've seen this in other parables where Jesus calls the workers to go out and he would pay them, uh, or rather the master would pay them one denarii for their work. That's one day's wage. So if you're getting 6,000 uh, denarii, that's the equivalent of approximately 20, 19 to 20 years of a wage. So that's why I asked that question. If, if you were given one talent, the equivalent of 20 years of a laborer's wage and told, go work it and use it or put it to work and do business or make profit out of it. Uh, in this particular parable, it's roughly silent, but it's been given. Okay, now imagine this. It's not one talent for the first servant. For the first servant, it was given five talents. The second one, two talents. And the third one, one talent. So five times 20, 100 years worth of the salary of a laborer. That's not small peanuts. That's a lot of money. The other point I want to make about this uh, allocation or entrusting of wealth is that each is given according to his abilities and really the value isn't so much talking, uh, the talking point about this parable. Again, it's an imaginary situation. What it's trying to convey is one talent is a lot. Uh, very much is given to the first person, five, two, and one talent. Whether it's one talent or five talent, it's still a large sum of money that's given to these people. So, I want to ask this question because uh, as we come to these observations, I'd like you to think about how this applies to your life. As Christ is gone and he is our master, or is, in the Greek it says the kurios, the Lord. As the Lord has uh, gone and is coming back again, he says that the kingdom of heaven is where this master who goes away for a while is entrusting his wealth to his servants. We kind of need to understand that, therefore, all of us, his disciples listening to this, have been entrusted with 
a portion of his kingdom in order to continue to do his work. work. We have a portion of wealth assigned to us while he goes away. Whether you recognize it or whether you don't, and the quantity and the proportion is kind of dependent on you and the abilities that you put to bear on what is happening. Now, let's continue. Verse 16, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Now, I'm going to pause here to explain a little bit that in the uh, New Testament period, uh, banks were not really very common, especially in, uh, in Jewish culture. <clears throat> And so in order for you to have a large store of money, you actually had to keep it safe in a treasury. And it wasn't uncommon for people to actually dig a hole and hide it. In fact, amongst my friends, amongst the Orang Asli, some of them still do that too. It's too far to go out into the town and it costs them a lot of money to go to a bank in town. So they find a place in the jungle, dig a hole, remember where it is and keep it there safe. So what I'm trying to convey here is that it wasn't uncommon and it was really a regular practice for people to dig a hole and bury their money in it. That's if you wanted to hide that money from thieves uh, stealing this money. So it was normal. There was nothing wrong with what he was doing. After a long time, the master of the servants returned, settled accounts with them. And then verse 20 says, <clears throat> The man who received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. You entrusted me with five. I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, verse 22 is almost like an exact a parallel repeat of the first servant, except it's the second servant, and the proportion is slightly low, uh, is the same, but it's a lower quantity. So the man with two bags of gold also came, Master, he said, You entrusted me two bags of gold, see, I've gained two more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, a few things I'd like to, to point out here before we even go into the third uh, servant and my second observation. Matthew, who's writing this, is making a point that the parable, when we read it, we see a pattern emerging, that the first and the second are seen as commendable and the disciples ought to learn about it, that although one has more resources given to them, and more entrusted to them, their job is to put it to work and to give unto the Lord what they have multiplied out of it. But then uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, the master's response is consistent for both of them, whether you earn back five talents or whether you earn back two talents, the answer is still the same. Well done, and the commendation is still the same. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Now, as I mentioned, one talent isn't a small thing. It's not small peanuts. And so the master is now saying, what small matter you have been uh, careful and a good steward of, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. But I'd also like you to pay attention to that last portion. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, let me go to the second observation I want to make about this. And the second observation is that the servant's response reveals their relationship to the master. The servant's response reveals their relationship to the master. The first two went immediately and put them to work. That's how the Greek is actually phrased. The two of them immediately, uh, two went immediately and put them to work. Put what? Put the talents to work, put their resources to work, put everything to work. And 
they both had identical uh, results. The third, however, went and buried it. The third person uh, is the contrast. So the parable is putting two things side by side and comparing the two. The two, the first two servants compared when immediately did the work and had identical results coming back. And the third, however, is the contrast, the parallel uh, opposing story and buried it instead. In other words, he did nothing. He went the safe path. So the immediacy of their response shows their interest in pursuing the master's will. If you uh, are responding quickly to what your boss is saying, you in a way have a good relationship with him and you want to get the project completed. They went to work straight away and they put their resources to use. Now there's no mention about the amount of effort or the amount of risk that was involved, only that they doubled uh, what was given to them when they went to work with it. I want to make this observation that all three were assigned differing responsibilities and differing responsibilities. They had differing uh, responsibilities and they had differing resources given to them, but they all had an equal obligation. So that's one of the main points I want to make about this uh, servant's response. Our servant's response reveals to us that our responsibility comes commensurate with the resources. In other words, the greater your responsibility, the master gives them greater resources in order to accomplish what, is, what they're responsible for. But whether your resources are great or large, whether your responsibility is great or large, the obligation is equal in all to go to work with what the master had given to them. So all three had equal obligation uh, put to them and they were required to put them to work. Now, you might sympathize with the third servant and, and I, in a way, do as well. Quite often we feel uh, we don't want to take risks. We don't want to uh, lose this uh, great resource that has been given to us. But I'd like you to remember that uh, he had an obligation he had a responsibility and an obligation and a resource given to him. The obligation was to put that to work. Instead, he decided not to do anything. And so quite often we feel afraid to take risks and do what we know needs doing. We don't want to lose what has been entrusted to us or even worse, when you put it in a way we understand it, we don't really want to get out of our comfort zones. It's a little bit like uh, Christians that go around and they wear their Christian hard hat. It's to make sure that we don't get hurt, that our ideas and our thoughts are all well protected. We're going to uh, ensure that our Christian hard hats are on so that our ideas and our dogmas aren't challenged and we refuse to have our ideals and our thoughts about certain things being challenged we would then wrap ourselves in the comfort of our Christian platitudes, our trite doctrines, our assurances of salvation and forgiveness. It's almost like, you know, how we take a blanket and we just wrap it all around ourselves so that we are nice and comfortable and cozy. And we feel really comfortable about this. And it's so cozy and warm and it's so good to be here. And not only that, in the comfort of our Christian community, we pray. We pray for others, hoping that someone else will preach the gospel, feed the poor, dress the naked, watch over the sick, depressed, suicidal, set captives free of their addictions and their violence. Not even to mention deal with demon-possessed people or if raise the dead, you know, isn't that really morbid? For many Christians who would rather do nothing, their greatest hope would be to go to bed each night safe, wrapped up in their blanket or comforter like I am right now, and to one day gently wake up and find themselves on the other side of heaven 
you know, I don't know how many of us are like that. You know, we go to bed every night thanking God and saying, oh, thank God I'm so safe today. And I didn't really take any risk with my faith. It's been a very comfortable day. Thank you, oh Lord, for your provision for all things. And we hope that one day we wake up and suddenly we find ourselves over off into the other side of heaven. In other words, we come before God and then we throw off everything and we say, ta-da, here I am, God. I've arrived. I've safely gotten here by doing nothing wrong. Is yours or mine a religion concerned only with not doing anything wrong? Is it a religion of safety instead of service? And hoping to avoid doing anything wrong, this third servant finished up by not doing anything right. So putting our talents to work is very much like an exercise of faith. You know, uh, the imagery that you have, if you were to do 100 push-ups or even 20 push-ups and you keep doing it every day, after a while, your muscles uh, build up and you find that doing the work becomes easier and easier and your capacity goes up. And so exercising our faith is a spiritual exercise that also strengthens our ability to do what needs doing. You find that our reward is that we can carry a heavier burdens and not feel tired and still feel good about what we're doing. But to those, uh, to, we understand this because at some point, at the end of this parable where the punchline comes, Jesus says in verse 29, to those who have, more is given. To those who have, more is given. And to those who do not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. So here's the thing, for those of us who are exercising our faith and actively doing what is right, rather than doing nothing, more will, give it, more will be given to us and we are strengthening our faith and the treasure, increasing the investment of the treasure that is invested in us, part of the kingdom. Now what's the flip side contra? If we lie in bed, like I did just now with the comforter, all nicely, all covered up, all bubble wrapped, if we lie in bed and we do nothing, a trophy takes over. I've had friends who, as a result of the fact that they are bedridden and homebound, uh, they constantly have to be turned over and moved or else they, their muscles atrophy and they get bed sores. And so what about the Christian who is a couch potato, who really sits there, watches, critiques and observes and says someone else ought to be doing this. It's, the great idea is this but someone else do it. That's in a way the focus of what this parable is, or at least in my view. So let's hear how the third servant responds to the master and how the master replies to the servant. Verse 24, the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know you are a hard man. I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. I like to point out here, this is a parable and it's using a lot of irony. It's not a reflection that God or Jesus is like this. It's just the, the way that the parable is being told. The cynicism and in a way the reflection of the heart and the nature uh, and, and the perspective of the third servant. He is a servant to the master, but he has a very dim view, a very negative view of the master. I know that you are a hard man. False assumption, uh, because it's been disproved. Why? Because when the two servants actually came and gave back to the Lord a multiplication of it, you saw the generosity uh, that has been given to them. Enter into uh, you know, you've been faithful with a few and I'm going to make you responsible and give you greater resources available to do this. And so this man has a, has a perspective of the master. You're a hard man harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And verse 25, so I was afraid. This man lives in a relationship of fear. Uh, of only complying where he needed to and not really trusting or not really experiencing or knowing the love of the master 
and, and you know, in a way, trusting the generosity of the master. So he went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Again, it's a parable. Understand that this is not what the master is acknowledging. What he's really saying uh, in this parable is, even if you knew, so if you assume that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Okay, so it's a, it's a form of a irony being there. If you assumed or if you thought that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So in other words, there was an obligation to try and make something out of what was given to him. He failed in an obligation in that responsibility and what was entrusted to him. And not only that, he did nothing. And as a, as a result, there's lost opportunity, lost interest, um, is basically not doing anything in the interest of the master, although he calls him master. Verse 28 is highlighted because this, in a way, is the end stress of a parable, the punchline and the answer about the question about the end of time and about uh, what to do or what happens at the end of time. So verse 28, take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. Wow. I want to pause there a moment for that to sink in for you. Uh, hopefully in the same way it sank in for me. The first person had five bags. He multiplied it into another five bags. So he had 10 bags. And the master is now saying, take the bag of gold or the talent from this third servant and give it to the one who now has the 10 bags. So he's got 11 bags under his care now. It's part of his responsibility and his share of the master's happiness. That's a huge amount of uh, benefit and blessing. It's almost as if uh, this first and the second servant was given resources to build something. And having built it, the master is then saying, whatever you built, that's now yours. That's now yours to work with and to do even more and welcome into my happiness. Have you ever thought about God's gift to you in that way? That whatever God has given to you that is of immeasurable value is built in order for you to enjoy and it is part of the kingdom that you are building that will never end. So you're putting to work for something that will last for eternity, storing up treasures in heaven. Then verse 29, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the end stress to this parable and the punchline. Whoever has more, more of what? More of what God has given and deposited in them and multiplied by putting it to work they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken for them. So let me come to my third point. The third point of this parable that no matter how long there is in the interim period, when the master returns, there is a settling of accounts. And one of the key points I want to highlight here, it was not the portion, but the proportion that made the difference. For both the first and the second servant, it was not the quantity that they responded with, but the proportion, both of them doubled what was given to them. In other words, they put to work what was given to them and the result was the same. It was doubling of their proportion. Uh, they were given greater responsibility and resources. And this is in a way the punchline of the parable that those who are found faithful will be given greater responsibility and resources but not only that, the most important one is to share their master's happiness. Now, these servants, the first two, started as servants or slaves, but the Lord you know, promoted them to a greater responsibility, a greater rule, and a shared happiness. And as a reward for managing faithfully a small amount, 
but actually it's a huge uh, quantity, 20, you know, uh, 100 years worth of wages. Uh, they will be put in charge of something big. Even the Lord Master says it. And so before the Son of Man comes, before Jesus comes again, and until that time, whenever it may be, disciples are called to faithful and steady service of the kingdom. Failure to fulfill his responsibility and obligation resulted in the third servant being called a wicked and lazy servant and cast out into the darkness. In other words, doing nothing is really not an option. We really need to be active in doing what is right rather than doing, uh, than, than basically uh, not doing wrong. Uh, so I want to, to plant that into our thoughts, you know, the, the second point. I say. It's, it's a matter of doing what is right and not just a matter of a religion of not doing anything wrong. So our responsibility is to respond to what God has called us to do. Now, the last I checked, the last I checked, my bank balance, uh, my bank account didn't suddenly jump by 20 years of wages when I became a Christian or even when I became a pastor or, you know, or every time I do something that is uh, faithful to God. It's not a matter about the amount of money uh, that has been placed into my care. It's uh, in essence, a, a treasure of great, great value that has been astounding. So I'd like to ask you and me, what have you gained from being a follower of Jesus that is of astounding value as a servant of God? What is that priceless pearl or that hidden treasure that Jesus speaks of in his other parables? <clears throat> Let me venture my opinion uh, on this, and I'm going to quote the words from uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. I repeat that, every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight, in love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. That's an astounding gift that's given to us. Because if you were to ask me what's your most precious thing that you hold close to your heart, I would say one of this is the thought and the assurance and the faith and belief that I am a child of God that I am holy and blameless before the God, made holy and blameless before, the, before God through uh, Jesus Christ. And not only that, that the gift of the Holy Spirit is within me, God himself with me in relationship. Now in the economy of God, where we are to store our treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt, this immeasurable treasure that we have received from Christ Jesus, our Lord and Master, who will come again and settle accounts, which is our every spiritual blessing, is our adoption in love into the family of God through the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ as holy and blameless in His sight, i.e. forgiven, reconciled people to God and one another. So my greatest treasure, therefore, and this, uh, this uh, entrusting that God has given to me is His Holy Spirit, uh, which tells me that I am a child of God. It causes me to call out Abba, Father. This Holy Spirit that has been given to me, that has been freely given to me when I believed in Jesus Christ, is that great deposit. And this treasure is a gift available to everyone. It's open to everybody who is willing to hear and respond to God's invitation. So, I understand this parable as that, that the master has given me a share of his estate. A part of himself is within me of immense value. And I'm told to put it to work that trusting in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, I invest my life into others that they too may also come into the kingdom and not only that, received that great immeasurable treasure. 
these persons who enter the kingdom of God become the return on investment, my ROI, <coughs> that I present to Jesus and hope to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And indeed, great indeed and stupendous indeed would be my happiness in sharing God's happiness when I see the people that I've invested my life in, the things that I've done for others out of service, out of uh, responsibility, out of obligation, my loved ones, my friends, and even my enemies, I hope one day to see them at the great reunion. Now, how does, how does Jesus teach about how do we invest ourselves in others? How are we making this, uh, putting this talent to work? He says so further on in the same chapter in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now, that, that's another parable maybe for another day. But for those of us who are familiar with it, uh, it's about the least in the kingdom, the naked, the blind, the one in prison, the one who is uh, hungry. He says that whenever you give food to eat, clothes to wear, and uh, comfort the prisoner and all these other things that he has taught us to do, you are doing it to the king. That's how we're investing back in and how we are blessing others. And whether or not there is a return, the parable doesn't say worry about that. No, it just says do what you are called to do. Do what the master has taught you to do. The return will sort itself out. So great indeed is, would be my happiness. Now, a lot of us are feeling very disappointed about the Chinese New Year, whether we will or will not be able to have a reunion, however the SOP is being mentioned. But I am looking forward to an even greater reunion at the end of the age when I gather together with all those who have gone before me, all those I've invested my life in, all those I have basically hoped to see. And that reunion would be great indeed when I know that we are all loved before God and the kingdom is stretched before us. So my motivation to fulfill my responsibility and obligation is high. I want to go immediately to work because I know it's immediately for my benefit too. Whatever I've done, whatever I invested in, the master says he gives it back to them and says, take more. I'm giving you greater responsibility. I'm in a way building and adding to the kingdom that is in store for me. So it pushes me forward. It motivates me to put my talents to work immediately. <clears throat> I don't know how some of you may be responding to this and how God is speaking to you. I reckon that he has given you some great gifts and some talents that you have put dormant and you say, I, I, I really am not too sure whether I want to go out of my comfort zone. I would urge you to look at that and to say, what does God want you to do? Brothers and sisters, will you go forth and courageously invest what God has placed within you into the lives of others so that they too may be holy and blameless children of God? Let me end with these three thoughts. <clears throat> I want you to know that as disciples, God's resources are for you to put them to work for him. One of the reasons I went into ministry was I decided that I didn't want to come in before God and have him ask me, of all that I've given to you and all the talents and resources, what have you put it to use and how have you invested it? I didn't want to have a situation where I was wealthy and filthy rich, but had not used it for God's kingdom. <clears throat> That's a great responsibility and it's an obligation for all of us how we best use what God has given to us. I've chosen to serve him this way. And I pray that even as you are successful and as God has blessed you in the way that you have, that you would find meaningful ways to apply it to the kingdom of God. What I'd like you to be is to be courageous, to not be fearful like the third servant or, and to, to actively put your talents uh, to work for him, that you would have a right view of God uh, not be fearful and think that he is a stingy God, but to be courageous, to step forward. No amount of knowledge is useful when what is needed is courage to take the step to do what is right 
rather than to just not do anything wrong. Lastly, do invest your life into bringing others into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> now that might take and involve uh, taking a risk. And I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about the many things that our church is doing. I was reading the, the announcements in the last two weeks and there's been this talk about a blood donation drive. And for some people, you might say that ah, it's for somebody else to do. I don't want to come out of my hat and my, my blanket and it's COVID-19 and all these other things. But you do recognize that every time you donate a pint of blood or a measure of blood, other lives are being saved that the life is in the blood, that Christ himself gave his life blood that others may live. And we're in a situation of uh, depletion. So there's been a request. And I'm not saying that I'm saying and arm twisting you and saying you better do. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, would you discern if God is placing within you the ability and the desire to do so, that you might consider doing it courageously in a safe way and invest uh, what you have safely. Now, this is just one example. It could be other things, mission work, social concerns work, work in the Hokkien, uh, Mandarin work, in McCallum. I leave it to you to talk to God how you can invest your life into bringing others into the kingdom of God. Shall we pray? Lord, grant us the courage to do what is right rather than to take the side of comfort and safety to do nothing wrong. Help us instead to be challenged at all times, Lord, to apply and use all that we are, our time, our talents, and our treasures to your kingdom's use, Lord. You have blessed us, Lord, in all our different places, and it's not that you call us all to be only of one type. You have made this body, Lord, and all of us have the ability to be a blessing. Grant, Lord, that you would use your Holy Spirit to speak into the hearts of those, Lord, who are challenged by this and who are tempted to bury their talents rather than to use it and invest it into the life of others and to be good news to those, Lord, who need you. May your word go forth, Lord. May it not return empty. This we ask and pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It's uh, usual amongst, uh, in my pattern, that I like to give some uh, questions for people to go back and talk about in their small groups or in your family discussion, maybe later on today or in your small group meetings. Uh, so I'd like you all to have a chance to talk about what work has God entrusted you with. Uh, <clears throat> it could be that somewhere along your life, God has placed a desire, a passion within you that over time has diminished and the flame has gone almost dying out. What work has God entrusted you with that you feel that you should be doing? Maybe talk about it with others, and maybe you find the courage uh, to respond. Secondly, what are you investing your life in? Is it for yourself and your family only, or is it an investment to the master's work? It's an obligation, it's a responsibility, and it's an entrusting of what he has given to you of all that you have when you spend when you stand before God, what is the accounting that you will give to him? And the third one, which is the easiest one, is are you making disciples? Because Jesus was putting this to his disciples and asking them at the end of Matthew, go and make disciples. That's how we invest lives in. So my challenge to you is are you making disciples? Are you putting your life intentionally into a few that you are naming in and spending time with them? and adding your resources in order for them to do what is right and good. Let's come to a time of prayer and a confession before the Lord. There are four items that I'd like to commit to prayer. Let me bring the first one to you. <clears throat> Let's pray for steadfast commitment to serve God and to invest our lives into others. Uh, as the message has been uh, conveyed, the words of the text has been given to you. Uh, may it speak to you. May there be a transaction between you and God at this point in time. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we pray that even as we have all these uh, things that need doing, uh, COVID-19, the blood donation drive, the social concerns, needs, 
uh, what's happening in the McCallum Tuition Centre, Lord. Even as we know that there are children who do not have access to mobile devices and data and plans that they cannot even do their online classes, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes, help us to step out of our comfort zones and our security blankets, Lord, and to put our faith and our, our talents and our giftings, Lord, to work, Lord. Through your Spirit, Lord, may your Holy Spirit stir in us and uh, be fanned into flame that we might hear what you have to say, Lord, and respond in accordance to your will. As you have entrusted us with great resources, Lord, and great responsibility, help us, Lord, with great resolve to be steadfast in putting it to service to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Our next item of prayer is for our communities that are affected by COVID-19, especially during this period. Now, we've actually gone through several uh, festive periods, I think Deepavali, Taipusam, Christmas, and now Chinese New Year. And the impact of COVID-19 on all our communities, we feel personally, or maybe you have uh, sufficient buffers and the blankets, uh, whereas others do not. Maybe it's time to ask a friend, a neighbor, someone in the community, is there a way I can help you and to really seriously grapple with that. I've been challenged with how God has blessed me and uh, I'm looking at the stuff that I have and I realize I've got multiples of many things that I could give away. It might help others in their time of need. Let us pray. Lord, even as our communities uh, celebrate the various festivals and public holidays, even as some are hoping to still travel and spend their reunion dinner with their loved ones, Lord, and even as we look to the New Year, the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year, Lord, we ask, Lord, for us to open our eyes and ears to the cries of the community around us, Lord, that we would not be deaf, that we would not be secluded in our ivory towers, Help us, Lord, to be open-handed and generous in what we have and to consider the plight of others, Lord, that through the things that we would do, we would be Christ in the midst of all of them, that when they see us and the things that we do, they will know that we are Christians by our love. Grant us safety in this time, Lord, and grant us, Lord, the ability to serve others and nonetheless be careful about how we serve you. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. Our third item is to pray for justice, mercy and righteousness for all in Malaysia. Some have been reading uh, Tommy Thomas's book. Uh, some have been uh, reading the recent news recently about uh, cases in the federal court and appeals for conversion uh, or, or other land right matters. And so justice and mercy is a constant concern in uh, Malaysia. Tonight, uh, there is an online uh, Facebook uh, seminar uh, remembering the fourth year anniversary of the disappearance of Pastor Raymond Ko, Ruth and Helmi, as well as uh, Amri Chekmat, people who, uh, according to Sahakam, may likely have been uh, the victims of enforced disappearance. Whichever way it is, we want to remember them and to recognize that justice and mercy and righteousness need to prevail in this country. We also want to give thanks for judges who continue to uphold the law and protect the rights of minorities as well as the, the downtrodden. Let's pray for the Lord's mercy and justice and righteousness for Malaysia. Let us pray. Lord, you see what happens in the darkness. You also see what happens behind closed doors. And you, O Lord, are a just God and a merciful God and a righteous God. Help us, Lord, where we are able to continue to be salt and light, to be pillars uh, that hold up what is right and true and to do what is right and true, even if it is to our disadvantage or discomfort, Lord. We pray and give thanks, Lord, for judges and lawyers and those who continue to do what is right, Lord, even in the face of extreme uh, threats of violence and abuse, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you keep them safe. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to persevere 
in doing what is just and true and to not turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to injustice, Lord. Change our hearts, Lord. We know that we need your Holy Spirit to transform us to do what is right. Do that work, Lord, and help us to be courageous and strong and step forth in doing what is right and true. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The fourth item and the last item from me is to pray for uh, Myanmar. There's been a military coup that was done on the 1st of February uh, as a result of uh, recent elections where um, the military junta has stepped in and taken control and said that they will have an emergency uh, military rule for one year. Many NGOs as well as Christian organizations have appealed for prayer and for help. And so I encourage us, uh, we rejoice with those who rejoice, we mourn with those who mourn. And so let's incline our hearts uh, that the Lord's will be done in uh, Myanmar, Burma, and that God's peace and this injustice would be lifted up from that nation. Let us pray. Lord, you have said that your house will be a house of prayer for the nations. So we lift up to you the nation of Myanmar and many others that are represented in our congregation and our community, Lord. We lift up to you our home country, Lord, and we lift up to you these nations, Lord, our brothers and sisters who are living in these countries, Lord. Watch over them, Lord, and keep them safe. And we especially pray for Myanmar that your peace, Lord, would descend and that you would lift up the shackles of injustice and violence and military rule. And we pray, Lord, for peace. We do not know, Lord, why you have allowed this, but in the testing and the, and the trials and tribulations that they face, grant them, Lord, your grace and mercy to overcome. Lord, we pray and ask all this, spoken and unspoken, whispered in our hearts and the echoes in our minds, Lord. Will you hear our prayers, Lord, and grant your mercy and grace to us as we pray and ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts, Lord, even. Uh, let's prepare our hearts now as I hand this time over to uh, Brother Luke in order for him to lead us with the affirmation of faith. Brothers and sisters, now uh, let us arise at where we are to affirm our faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true Church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare that let us say together, We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power and love, whose mercy is over all His works, and whose will is ever directed to His children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Now let us glorify the Lord together. Let us say the offertory prayer together. Eternal God, may the offerings we give to you reflect our willingness to be a good steward of what you have given to us. Grant that our offering be used by you for the sake of the advancement of your kingdom. Amen. 
brothers and sisters, whenever we come before the Lord to worship Him, we ought to bring Him our offering of thanksgiving, knowing that our Lord is the source of all blessings. So now let us pause for a moment to determine an amount that we would want to give to the Lord, to the church and to the ministry this week. Now let us pause for a moment. The monetary offering that you have decided uh, to be to to give may be given to the church through online bank transfer. If possible, please do so by this week. Now let us sing the doxology together. Seated. Welcome once again to our online worship service of Wesley Methodist Church Penang this morning. At this time, I also want to uh, specially extend a very warm welcome to those who are here with us for the first time. I pray that uh, if you are here for the first time, you will find this time of worshiping the Lord and listening to His Word uh, a time of meaningful to you. And we would be glad if you can continue to join the service in the weeks to come. So welcome you once again if you are here for the first time. I believe all of us uh, we want to thank Pastor Ronald for his ministry of the word, uh, for preaching the word of God to us to, uh, so that we can understand the hearts of God. Yeah. We also want to thank God for our worship and blessed this morning. Sister Lian May, our worship leader, Brother Jared, our song leader, and Sister Florence, our scripture reader not forgetting our IT team who work really hard behind the scene to make this online worship service possible. We want to give thanks to God for these people, for their uh, faithful service unto Him and unto us. Uh, today, there's only one announcement that I would want to highlight. Um, given the understanding that the hospital uh, in Penang are running low on blood supplies currently due to the reduce of blood donor during this time of pandemic. As such, on behalf of Social Concern Committee, I'd like to encourage you, if you are healthy and willing, please sign up to be a blood donor. The way to sign up is by filling up the Google form at the link given here, or you can also contact Ai Ching, Auntie Christine, or Brother Isaac. When we manage to get at least 30 donors, right, we will arrange for the blood bank to set up a collection point in our church premise. So uh, our act of donating blood will be uh, an act of showing our cares to our society. So please do so if you are healthy and you are willing. That's all for the announcement today. Now let us prepare our hearts to come before the Lord's table to receive the Holy Communion. Dear friends, uh, as we come to the Lord in this uh, time of Holy Communion, uh, let me remind you to actually have your uh, communion elements available and uh, in front of you. Uh, for me, I've got my juice as well as my wa wafer here or biscuit. And if you don't have juice, or you can use water. Or if you don't have bread or wafer, you can use a biscuit. Let's respond to the Lord and remembering that this is the Lord's invitation. Will you adopt an attitude of reverence before the Lord, whether standing, seated, or kneeling? And let us hear the invitation to the Lord. Our Methodist Church prepares an uh, open table. And so all those who have been baptized and are in good standing in other denominations are also invited. And we also practice uh, pedo communion. So children who have been baptized and who have been brought up in the way of the Lord and also partake. So as a family, uh, we can do this together. And I invite the head of the household, uh, whether mom or dad, 
uh, to basically be the one serving these elements. Will you now hear the invitation to the Lord's table? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's take a moment as you come to the Lord in a silent confession, uh, asking the Holy Spirit to bring to mind any wrongdoings we have committed or any failure to do what is right uh, rather than uh, doing what is safe. Let us hear these words of assurance and comfort from the Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. Let me offer you to uh, this moment to turn to anyone in your surrounding, if you're at home, uh, to offer another one another signs of reconciliation of love. Uh, if you're alone on your own and you want to send greetings, uh, there's a chat function in the Zoom and you can make it interactive by sending a message to everyone uh, through the chat. grace and peace of God be with you and to everyone in your household. Even as we continue to uh, share the peace, let's continue with the service. I pray that you have this before you, uh, the glass of wine and also uh, the biscuits uh, or the wafers before you. And uh, if you've had them covered during this time, it's a good time to uncover it. And I invite the head of the household, uh, if he's there or if she's there, to basically uh, come near. Let us continue. With hearts of thanksgiving, I invite you to remember something that you are thankful for this week and uh, to hold it close to your heart so that what we say is not empty ritual and empty words. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. 
he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer of ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will, will come, come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we also have forgiven those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, I pray that you distribute the elements now and we partake of the sacraments together. So in the family, would you uh, hand out the bread and also the blood, uh, the juice? And uh, i give you a few moments to, to work this. And for those who have it now, I invite you to hold the bread in your hand. The body of our Lord Jesus given for you. Amen. Amen. Let us partake of it. Even as we have remembered the body of our Lord Jesus given for you, let us hold forth the blood of Christ that is given for you. Do you have the cup? Will you respond accordingly? The blood of Christ that is shed and given for you. Amen. Take and drink this in remembrance of our Lord Jesus and may it preserve you to life everlasting. Friends, while you are partaking of the communion, I'd like to remind you that on Communion Sunday, we normally have a second offering, which is for the poor and needy. And so you can do the same by uh, transferring the sum or putting it in an envelope and uh, trying to find a way to keep it aside until the MCO is over, then you can pass it to the church office. Or you can remit it to our bank account number. Just indicate in the transcript that it is a second offering February, and the office will know what to do uh, with it. Let us continue. Even as we have heard the message of God and as we want to respond with all that we are, that all that is given to us, we recognize that all that we have comes from God. Naked we came, naked we will return to the Lord. All that we have is from the Lord. So we pray this and sing this together with our dear brother Jared. Take our life, let it be.
them flow in ceaseless breeze. Take my hands and let them move. Let the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be sweet and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee, filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold what a might would I withhold? Take my intellect and use every power as I should choose. Every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I fall. Myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for Friends, we've come to the end of the service. Will you take a moment to respond to the Lord in your own way? And I will then end with a benediction. Let us pray. Brothers and sisters, that which you have heard from the Lord, go forth and therefore do with courage and strength. That which comes from the mouth of a mere mortal, may it fall to the ground, may it rest in the dust where it belongs. Go forth from here, therefore, knowing that all that you are, all that you've ever been, and all that you will ever be, is a gift from God that you might put it to work in service of our Lord and our Master. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, will you join me in singing the threefold Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, our service is ended, but our fellowship is not. And I invite you to take time now to switch on your video and your audio. This is the moment when a lot of people are catching up with each other so that we might share the peace and have some fellowship and say hello to everyone. God bless you. And if you have to leave, we'll see you again uh, next week. Have a blessed Chinese New Year celebration as best as you can as it comes up. And for those who want to celebrate, uh, uh, Valentine's Day with us next week as well. Uh, do join us for our service and uh, greetings to everyone. Stay safe. 
and God bless. Come, let's have a chat with each other. Hi, Ron. Pastor Ronald, good morning. Hey, Pastor Ronald. Morning. 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 Hi. Hello. Hi. Pastor. Bye. Hi. Hi. Dr. Singh. Hi. 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 Hello, Pastor. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for your message. Thank you. I did loud and clear. Nice to see you, Pastor. Hello, Pastor. Hi, Mr. Lim. Hi, Mr. Lim. Hi, Margaret. Hello, Pastor. Hi, Mr. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Mr. Lim. Hi. How are you? Good morning. Good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Paula. Hi. 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 Uh, hi, hi, Yuns. Hi, Yuns. Hi, Datuk Ki. Hello, Hello, everyone. Hi, Luca. Hi, Christine. Hi, Helen. Hi, Hello. Hello, everyone. Ali. Hello. Hello, Ali. Hello. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hello. Hello. So many still. Hello. Hi, Ardi. Hi. 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 Hello, Irene. Yeah. Hi. Morning. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello, Hi. 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 Margaret. Hi. 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 Hello, Hi. 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 Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Where's your mother? Uh, mother. Ayo. <laughs> what happened? Hi. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Are we, are we having reunion in Pasca Malam? You can have a reunion. Datuki, you can set up. Set up Pasar Malam di Kamp. Come, come and spend it in my garden. I have a Pasar Malam. Pasar Malam and just open. Yeah. We shall take over the rest house land. And just open, and then we can have Pasar Malam. We will set up our stores. <laughs> oh, we, we can set up my pasta, uh, pasta malam in the church grounds. <laughs> yeah, provided we don't all go to jail. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what our reunion is going to be like. You know, for for my case, it's just Tung Simpoi and Ki Kek Jin. That's not a lot. No relevant time reunion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no. Um, oh, what shall we do? Huh? Hey, you do it on Wednesday oh, now. Yep. Oh, Elsie. Elsie. Hi. 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 Happy Hi. New Year. Happy New Year. Hey. Why wow, you Happy cut your hair already? Yeah, everybody. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Bye. 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 Hello. 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 And Estelle. Estelle. Estelle grows so fast, my goodness. Mm. Yeah, all the children always grow very yeah. fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Faith, where are you, Faith? I don't are you in your pajamas? I am I am here, but then he says that you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, well, oh, hello. 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 Okay. Ah, there you are. Ah, there you are. There you are. Oh, you yes. Oh, yes. Oh, hey. 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 Hey.
Hi, Hi everyone. The doggy. Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that's Abby. So nice. Yes, Abby. 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 Oh, oh, Abby. Oh. Hi, bye. Yeah. Wait. Oh, hello. Hi. Hello. Happy New Year. Hello. Happy New Year. New Year. New Year. New Year. Oh, who is? New Year. Oh, Hi, Florence. Hello. Hi, Florence. hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, that is also really happy new year to the Yun Florence, family. Yeah, to the Yun. Hi, Elsie. Yeah. All the Yun family. The whole Yun, Yun family. Dr. Ding. Hi, Dr. Hi. Dr. Ding and Dr. Go. Elsie, <laughs> we, <laughs> Elsie, we miss the choir. We miss yeah. the choir. Ah, we're going to have a virtual one on Easter yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Miss your choir. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> <laughs> But maybe MCO will be listed. Lah. Hi, Joan. Hello, Joan. Hi. Okay, everyone. Bye bye. Joan, bye bye. Happy New Year. 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 Happ